the grim reality is that we've got an abominable humanitarian crisis and it's a uh, and my experience is that it's being downplayed, downplayed from what I see on the ground, the hundreds of communities that I travel to, and I've traveled hundreds of homeland communities right throughout this continent. In Western Australia, one in four of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicides, one in four of First Nations deaths in Western Australia are a suicide. That's an abominable humanitarian crisis, and yet where's the political will in our nation to galvanize the ways forward to redress? Nationally, we've got the crisis of officially 5.2%, 5.2% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, uh, its deaths uh, being a suicide. That's one in 19 of all deaths a suicide. But my research and, and uh, my experience on the ground says that it's much higher because of underreporting issues and the coronial determination uh, criteria that needs to be met. Uh, the reality is that it's one in 10, but either or of these statistical narratives, they're harrowing, they're staggering, and, uh, and it does matter. The statistical narratives do matter because when we translate them, they're, they're the extensiveness of how huge and this crisis is, and yet it's not the pressing issue of our times in terms of it being a national priority, but it should be the pressing issue of our times, and we'll be damned in the future as we've damned the past for the apartheid, the stolen generations, the stolen wages, the segregation, for all the people that we left behind on the missions to rot in the reserves. And uh, that's what the future will damn us for, for uh, what is actually a systematic destruction of, uh, of communities uh, who are impacted for every suicide whole. There's a wilderness of grief in these communities. For me, who travels these communities and who, uh, who sits at the table in, in the households of families affected by suicide-related trauma uh, and the outpouring and the grief uh, well, I've met no family that hasn't poured its grief out. This business of shame and taboo and silence is not true. They all want to uh, speak to their grief. They all want to pour their hearts out. They all don't want to lose another member of their family. And uh, it's the listening that's actually not happening. It's the listening that's not happening. And we've got this wider community perception, this past the buck perception that there's silence, uh, shame and taboo, not true. The shame is actually a national one, it's us. It's the nation that's not listening, and it's our governments, our peak body, who is the only one with the capacity to actually make a difference at that type of political reform required to you know, improve the lot of others to save lives. And there's no greater legacy than we can have than to improve the lot of others to the point of saving lives. But we don't do that. We don't do that. And we hide the grim reality of what's actually happening on the ground. And we're trying to sell messages that things are improving when actually that's a lie. That's a lie. For all the good news stories, there are hundreds and hundreds of grieving families who are losing not only to the tip of the iceberg um, tragedy, that culmination, suicide, but losing them to endless despair, dejection, sense of hopelessness, from broken lives to ruined lives, and filling our jails. One in nine of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living alive today have been to prison in this continent, on this continent. One in six in the Northern Territory and one in six in Western Australia and one in 13 of all Aboriginal adult males in Western Australia, First Nations males, is in prison today. That's an abomination, moral, political and otherwise. This is the 12th biggest economy on the planet and yet we have the widest gaps between the first peoples of this continent and the rest of the population and uh, we have the widest gap the widest divide of any other nation with a colonial oppressor history. And we are a high income nation as opposed to a lot of these other colonial oppressor nations which are uh, uh, middle, low or middle income nations. In the end we're all human beings and in the end we're all one. And in the end a majority of this nation and our parliaments uh, do not uh, stand by and alongside in the ways that matter to improve the lot of others and to redress and do the equality. I've come out of a community on Groot Island in the Gulf of Carpentaria where we lost a 13-year-old girl only a couple of months ago. Um, and there's been a quiet about that and what needed to be done on the island to improve in terms of the ways forward so there's less likelihood of this happening again hasn't been done. So of course I'm going to soak up the heartbreak and the tragedy and, and the distrust and mistrust of our governments and of, of the national consciousness. Um, I've been to one community recently which left me inside just wailing 
in a country so affluent, in a country that should be opportune to all, that we deny people their right to a livelihood, that we deny people the opportunity to navigate their two cultural settings out of their own and that of the mainstream without impost to each other. But there was the one community where in three days we buried five young people, the youngest a 15-year-old girl and another a 17-year-old youth. And I went to the funerals and um, I stood at those funerals and there was barely a non-Indigenous person there. Where were the teachers and the school counsellors and, and the nurses and, and, uh, and the, and the, and the counsellors from the actual uh, local government authority itself and the people of stature to actually pay their respect, to turn out as they would for a non-Indigenous child who had been lost? That has never left me and yet the nation hasn't been, doesn't see this doesn't see it to the extent that it's actually saw what actually happened, for instance, just recently at, at Don Dale, the juvenile detention facility, and uh, the nation was actually shocked when it was all packaged together by the ABC Four Corners report. And, uh, and you know, in, in the end, it, it's much the same. I'm hoping that in some way we can take to the nation at some point, some point soon, because the longer we take, the more blood will soak up, if I may say, because that's the reality, that's the grim reality and of young people lost at ages when they've got half a century and three quarters of a century to go of all these potential life years lost and of so much more that they should and could be doing denied. And it's our fault, it's our responsibility, it's our burden. But we need to galvanise the ways forward. I've called for a Royal Commission to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicides because I believe the multifactorial issues are not being addressed, that we've never had a deep examination of what more needs to be done. And, uh, and we always work at the surface level or we pass the buck or, or this bullshit of cost aversive uh, is damning when society gears itself towards the economy instead of the other way around. When we're supposed to be putting people first at all times, when human life should be our priority. We've just had a federal election and uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the First Nations people, the loss of human life uh, by its own hand from that cesspool of issues or whatever that we fail to always address, didn't get a mention, didn't get a mention. That I came to tears many times over reflecting and in those weeks we've lost more lives. In those weeks of electioneering, in those weeks of uh, one of the wealthiest nations on the planet actually arguing its case for more to be done in terms of material comfort to those who already have it amongst, who have it best who have it best, you know, in comparison to the rest of the world and probably in comparison to the whole of history. And yet we've got in our country a marginalised people, third world akin. That's an abomination. And it's, an, it, it's a, a damning indictment of our parliamentarians, of the political machinery, of the, uh, of the instruments of the state. With Dondale Juvenile Detention Centre, um, the incidences that we saw of brutality, of obscene, aberrant, abominable brutality were, were over a long period of time, from 2010 to 2015, and they were actually uh, put out in the public domain piecemeal again and again and again and reported and gone to our um, government instruments. And, um, and, and to the nation, people had read some of it in, in the media. I had written about it widely myself too. And uh, we had known of the gassing, we had known of the, uh, 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 of, uh, all the incidences that were described and, and demonstrated and visualised in that Four Corners report. But only when we got uh, that social reach the Four Corners could actually provide and the build up and the preface of the brutality of it did the nation actually pay attention and respond. All those issues that we saw at Dondale are actually endemic, pernicious right throughout the country. I've dealt with many families and assisted many families who have reported much the same of what actually occurred at Dondale, the brutality, the bashings, the degradation, the verbal abuse, the lockdowns, 23 hours of the day, the isolation, and, uh, and um, you know, and this is not how we should be working with our young people, how we should be working with any in individual. People come out of prison and juvenile detention in general worse than what they went in, and uh, all we do is set them up for a life of failure, for a life of diminution, uh, and, and look, you're actually 10 times more likely to lose your life, unnatural death, suicide, uh, in the first year post-release than at any time while in prison. So, where's the restorative stuff? We haven't galvanised all that. Where's the rehabilitative stuff in terms of healing and well-being and, uh, and opportunity, educational training and employment opportunities? B uh, whatever programs that I've involved myself with in working with people pre and post-release, to work in that redemptive, restorative, educative way, they've all worked. 
they've all worked. So they're all evidence based on the, pre on, on the premise that we've got measurable indicators on the success stories that we have. And we've worked also with advocacy to actually assist their families with uh, other multifactorial issues. But our governments don't invest in this. Our governments don't invest in this. Similarly so with the socioeconomic uh, disadvantage and acute in many of our remote homeland communities and even in the fringes of the urban masses. We don't redress anything and we make things worse. And what we've actually led now is to this constancy of trauma that has degenerated far too many people into, um, in, into aggressive complex traumas. But there's elevated risk groups. There's also elevated risk groups. We know the demographic risk groups. We know that the Kimberleys, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the second highest suicide rate in the world behind Greenland's Inuit peoples. That's an abomination of this, and an indictment of this nation that such a tragedy, such a tragic, uh, suicide rate exists in the Kimberley, in the Kimberley, in terms of even life expectancy. One in three adults will be dead by 45 years of age. We also argue that the life expectancy in this country, in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, has been reduced to 10.6 years. That's, that is a lie. That is one of the great propaganda, if I may say. It, I can tell you the statistics. In 2014, the median age of death for Aboriginal males in Western Australia was 49.9. The highest was New South Wales, the median age for Aboriginal males uh, at death at 57.8 or 58 years of age. So where is it that we're li uh, people are living 10 year, 10.6 years? That's a calculation, that's a target on people born today that they hope will be met, but we know targets aren't met, like closing the gap targets and the Millennium Goal targets, they're not met. They fail again and again and again. This is why I do take out the grim reality to the world, because without the truth, we can't go forward. Without the truth, we can't identify what needs to be done. We, we sell out a whole generation hoping that generations in the future what, you know, will be sold out by an assimilationist bent agenda, which will plateau out the uh, statistical narrative as identity uh, is assimilated and, uh, and high cultural content is blown away or whatever. But the price that's being paid is that we are losing our young people at ages that should never be imagined and at numbers that should never be known and fathomed. Our politicians, our parliamentarians, need to walk the neighbourhoods that I have, need to see the grief and pain of these families, need to sit at the table and, and, listen, and, and listen to them at long last, because that's the complaint that actually is, that they're not being listened to, not authentically, and hear the outpouring. And one of the reasons I've called for the Royal Commission to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicides is even though we may never galvanise the suite of recommendations uh, in terms of implementation that we would desire and the political reform that's necessary to get to equality and justice, uh, they need to be validated. These people want their stories told. They need to be heard. They have the right to shift the nation's consciousness. They have that right and they need that. I don't want to have to keep on being at funerals where we bury our children. I don't want to have to see, it's not just the children, Recently, a father took his life at 30 years, 36 years of age. He left behind eight young children, eight young children. Imagine the darkness in his mind, the pain and the grief and the suffering that brought a father of eight to leave those eight young children behind. A mother took her life recently, a 28-year-old mother who left three young children behind. She was never supported, she was never helped. And that's the, that's the reality for all of them. We don't do the spreading of the love. We don't do the compassion. The nation needs to hear this. The nation has to have a look at itself as why are our people taking their lives, why are the First Nations people of this country taking their lives at a rate that should make no sense to anyone. And Australia should be shamed. Australia should be shamed because Australia, Australia is the mother of all jailers of its First Peoples. The more west we go across the country, the worse it gets. The mother of all jailers is actually Western Australia where it jails Aboriginal adult males at the highest rate from a racialized lens right throughout the world. But when we talk about juvenile detention, when we talk about juvenile detention, the entire national juvenile uh, detention population, it's actually the highest rate in the world, higher than the mother of all jailers of the United States of America, higher than them.
higher than the mother of all jailers, the United States of America, which jails nearly 1% of its whole population. 2.6 million Americans are in jail today. When it comes to our young people, this nation has the highest juvenile detention rate in the world, in the world. And of course, sadly, tragically, half the juvenile detention population is uh, comprised of uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations youth in the Northern Territory. It's a tragedy. It's, it's, it's of abominable, uh, unbelievable, unimaginable rates. 98%, 98% are actually in juvenile detention who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. If, the, if our mainstream media doesn't take it out of the nation, how will the nation know? And how will we galvanise change? And how will we be believed? How will we be able to corroborate all this stuff? But in the end, we need that mainstream media to come to the fore. Otherwise, we will keep on plodding along. We will keep on plodding along. They need to come to the fore, as they did with that particular episode on ABC Four Corners with Don Dale. On that one singular occasion, they need to do it on every occasion. And with them, alongside, if they were to do that, if they were to be noble, if they were to be moral, if they were to be righteous, if they cared about the common good, if they were to be virtuous, they should be doing it 24-7 through care. Then we'll make a difference. Then we'll get the political reform. Then we'll get the government to respond.